Warning, 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 warning. The Operation Daintree report on the investigation of improper influence and compromised procurement and contract management process finally dropped on the 18th of April 2023. You may remember Operation Daintree as the IBAC investigation that hit the headlines just prior to the Victorian election, thanks to a story broken by The Age. It was a whole thing. There was a Supreme Court injunction that prevented The Age publishing draft findings, followed by the Premier releasing what would have to be one of the vaguest media releases of all time. He then went on to front a press conference where he dodged questioning, instead referring the press pack back to his statement no less than 37 times. It was all pretty cringe. Before we get into the Premier's piss-weak response to the Daintree report, let's take a look at what Operation Daintree was all about. Way back in 2018, the Health Workers Union, or the HWU, through their secretary, began lobbying an advisor in the Premier's private office, with a proposal for the then recently union-established Health Education Federation to provide workplace training. The Andrews government relationship with the HWU has at times been a turbulent one with the HWU not shy when it comes to attempting to force their will on the Andrews government. I'd hazard a guess that this is probably not surprising given some of the personalities that have been linked to the union in the past. Take this letter from the HWU to the Premier, for example, which effectively amounts to the HWU threatening to campaign against the Andrews government if they don't get their way. The HWU carry a lot of baggage, but are also capable of generating a lot of noise. Noise that you'd have to think might not necessarily be all that welcome in the lead up to an election. Hypothetically, of course. Of course. In June 2018, the HWU submitted what has been described as an unsolicited proposal to the then Minister for Health's office. With the 2018 state election being held on the 24th of November, the Department of Health and Human Services entered into a $1.2 million contract with HEF on the 30th of October, the final day before caretaker conventions took effect. In May the following year, IBAC received a complaint from an anonymous source that alleged the award of the contract constituted serious corrupt conduct. If nothing else, perception can be everything. As the former health minister, Jenny Makarkos, conceded in the IBAC investigation, it certainly looked now as if the HEF contract was a way of injecting funds into the HWU. Let's just say it, if you've read the Operation Daintree report and you think it's a big green tick for the Victorian government and you think there's nothing to see here, you've probably got rocks in your head. <laughs> This report should raise a number of red flags for the voting public, and at the same time highlight just how hamstrung IBAC is in Victoria. As the Victorian Ombudsman points out, this report is damning. I would describe it as a damning report. I don't think they heard you in the back. It was a damning report. To suggest otherwise is disingenuous at best. So let's take a look at Daniel Andrews' initial reaction to the Operation Daintree report. Uh, as you know, uh, IBAC have today uh, tabled a report. Uh, we thank them for what they term an uh, educational report. Is that right? Nope. A report under their, uh, if you like, the role that they play in trying to educate uh, all of us about risks and about ways in which we can deliver continuous improvement. Uh, we thank them for that report. There are 17 recommendations made in that important educational report. Why does he keep saying that? Uh, I will lead, uh, as the Chair of the Cabinet, a Cabinet process to consider those issues uh, and we will respond in due course, uh, but we're grateful for that educational report. It's on repeat! <laughs> and those 17 findings, or 17 recommendations I should say, and uh, we will uh, get on with that work and, uh, and update you. I do want to make a couple of points. There are no findings against uh, anyone in this uh, report. Uh, it, is, it is an educational report. Really? Again? And they're not my words, that's the, uh, the way in which IBAC themselves have uh, described this. I'm not sure that's true. Let's be very clear here. The term educational report is not used by IBAC in either the full 128-page Operation Daintree special report, the summary of the investigation published by IBAC, the recommendations published by IBAC, the media release issued by IBAC, or the video released by IBAC summarising the investigation and the findings. To refer to the Operation Daintree special report as an educational report, that's incredibly misleading and I'd argue outright deceptive to be frank. Hi Frank. 
Obviously, uh, I am accountable and fundamentally responsible for uh, driving a process to consider those 17 recommendations, to look at them very carefully, uh, to potentially further engage with IBAC to seek their advice, uh, and then to respond uh, once that work has been done. Given the educational elements of this, uh, it's not about taking action immediately, it's not about necessarily responding to uh, calls for action and findings that have been made against anybody. There are no findings against anyone in this uh, report. Uh, I think we do have the time to get this right, and we should. It's question time. I'm happy to take any, uh, we are happy to take any uh, questions you have. Do you think you've, you said you accept responsibility, you didn't apologise. Do you think you have anything to say sorry for? Well, uh, my role, Raf, is to uh, be accountable, of course. And again, I just stress, I've seen some of the coverage this morning, I just stress again, uh, for people watching and listening, uh, that there are no findings against anyone in this uh, report. The Anti-Corruption Commission has looked at a series of matters from some years ago and have found no corrupt conduct. But that's just a fact. I I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. I mean, this is technically true. IBAC found that the evidence did not establish corrupt conduct as defined in Victorian law. Under Victorian law, conduct is corrupt only if it constitutes a criminal offence. However, our investigation did substantiate the factual allegations that had been made. Through its connection with the union, HEF was able to gain privileged access to ministerial advisers. Ministerial advisers improperly intervened in the department's procurement processes. Senior executives within the department disregarded the concerns of their staff, failed to provide frank advice to the minister, and allowed their perceptions of the minister's preferences to affect the decision to award the contract to HEF. HEF failed to provide adequate training under the contract. When the department indicated its concerns about this, the union sought support from the Premier's private office. An advisor in the Premier's office then engaged with the Minister for Health's office, who in turn improperly interfered with the department's management of the contract with HEF. IBAC was unable to find evidence to establish corrupt conduct as defined in Victorian law. But those last five words are the key here, as defined in Victorian law. The reality is that Victoria has a ridiculously high bar when it comes to establishing whether or not our politicians have engaged in corrupt conduct. Corrupt conduct for the purposes of IBAC and Victorian law is defined in the IBAC Act 2011. The definition spans four pages, but there are seven words in there that make sure grey corruption in Victoria repeatedly goes unpunished. Conduct that would constitute a relevant offence. In other words, without criminal conduct, there can be no finding of corrupt conduct as defined in Victorian law. Obviously then, that's leaving a lot of politically dodgy behaviour on the table for Victorian politicians. And it's why we see investigations, such as Operation Watts and Operation Daintree, unable to make a finding of corrupt conduct as defined by law. There is a disturbing pattern of behaviour in Victoria when it comes to integrity. It's really no secret that IBAC is hamstrung in its duties. This has been recognised by a whole number of experts in the field, and the former IBAC commissioner himself made that very clear. IBAC's jurisdiction and some, some other interstate commissions, jurisdiction is confined to investigating conduct only where there are reasonable grounds to suspect that a crime has been committed. Such jurisdictional thre thresholds unduly restrict a commission's capacity to investigate misconduct which falls short of criminal conduct. The New South Wales ICAC and the Queensland C have a much broader capacity to investigate conduct that is not constrained by suspicion that the subject of the complaint is criminal. Politicians in Victoria are able to avoid scrutiny and it would seem get away with things their counterparts across the border in New South Wales could only dream of. Here's an awkward reality for many that follow politics on social media. If the Daniel Andrews government operated in New South Wales, under the New South Wales ICAC, it's likely that many of the investigations they've been embroiled in would have been played out in public, not in private. Unfortunately, there are some conditions which restrict the IBAC Commission's ability to conduct public hearings. It may not do so unless there are exceptional circumstances and the issue is serious or systemic. The witness would not be examined in public unless there is cogent evidence that demonstrates 
that the witness has miscon misconducted themselves, that the entire Labor and Coalition membership of the committee spoke with one voice without exception, that exceptional circumstances should be there. To stop public inquiries except in the most exceptional, exceptional circumstances, circumstances, whereas the Greens else. and the Independents all said, no, it shouldn't. And one couldn't help but, of course, have an uneasy feeling that the reason that Labor and the Coalition took the position that they did was because they assumed that one or other of them is likely to be in government at any moment of time and they are. it will be the members of Parliament from those parties that would then be exposed to public hearings. Here's another awkward reality for the Labor fans that have been following the New South Wales ICAC investigation involving Gladys Berejiklian. Victoria's IBAC could not have investigated the allegations into Gladys Berejiklian that ultimately led to her resignation. This is a reality highlighted by Victorian Greens MP and the new chair for Victoria's Integrity and Oversight Committee, Tim Reid. Even if it had somehow managed to meet the threshold for an investigation, in all likelihood the saga would have played out behind closed doors and the general public would have been none the wiser. Stephen Charles, former judge of the Victorian Court of Appeal, and now on the board of directors for the Centre of Public Integrity, has previously written about the weaknesses of the Victorian IBAC. Writing for the Australia Institute, Charles highlighted a number of IBAC's flaws and outlined why it was essentially not fit for purpose. Coming up on our next episode. I'm not here to have a debate with people who used to do a job, who've written a letter that apparently says a whole bunch of stuff. I haven't even seen the letter. Uh, I think it says a lot about the Premier's um, views on corruption and integrity. Mm -hmm.